Okay, I can start. Yes, please go ahead. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is my second and the last talk. Uh, just to quickly uh, revise, yesterday we talked about telescopes and spent a lot of time on the black body radiation and its consequences and so on. And today, will be really form, uh, talking about the photometry and most of it will be on spectroscopy. And uh, I added one more slide yesterday. So as we go along, I will tell you because that will be useful when I explain the basic photometry uh, measurements. So this is the outline today, a uh, brief introduction. I also thought I will add some part about the imagers and photometers on the instrument side. And then a bit about the basic photometry and then move on to uh, spectroscopy. And there will be a few slides on what is a spectral line and then details about spectrometers. How do you reduce the data once you go to an observatory? What are the preparations? And as I mentioned yesterday, the last slide will have all the references to these both talks. So let's start here. Uh, CCD, all of you have heard. Uh, in fact, all your cell phones now have CCDs. CCDs uh, kind of started about uh, now, I would say almost 30, 40 years back. Uh, they uh, were a really a big uh, advantage for the astronomers because as we see the quantum efficiency, that means if you have a detector, let's say it's a box, and if say 100 photons hit the box, what you get out of it, if it is 10, 20, 90, that is the percentage in quantum efficiency. So we see a plot which will tell about human eyes, quantum efficiency, photographic film, and other things, including CCD. So CCD uh, is a very efficient device. There are limitations, but uh, the good thing about CCD is it's a fully digital uh, device, which means you can take the image on the computer and you can analyze each and every part of that uh, image and in general do whatever a simple photometer would do. So the difference like yesterday's slide mentioned that with telescopes, either you can do photometry or you can do imaging. So photometry conventionally is a single 1D device where all the light is collected on one small uh, pixel. Pixel is a word used in CCDs, which was basically one unit on which the photometer detector was there. But once CCDs came, it's almost like a full image where it can be thousand by thousand or even bigger ones. That means thousand pixels by thousand. It's almost thousand photometer detectors sitting on this, on the, on the frame. So this is interestingly, uh, one of the pictures taken by uh, photography. Okay, this is, uh, you can see it's, it's some Fuji Chrome camera, and you can see the beautiful picture. But one has to see uh, two things here. The, now I have already mentioned pixel is the smallest unit on this image. In photographic film, the high good quality films could go up to five micron by five micron, right? Uh, but CCDs uh, has one handicap even now. I think the smallest one still is about nine by nine micron. There are advantages and disadvantages both. So, like I mentioned about two types of telescopes. Astrophotography though has enormous limitations on the sensitivity aspect, but they were there for last 100 years or more. But in CCD, you can do much more than that. And this is just to tell you that these are the beautiful pictures of all the galaxies which you see. If you go to any astronomy institute, including Ayuka or even outside, you will see a lot of nice pictures in the library or on the walls of the institute. These were mostly done by David Malin. He was from Australia. He, he has visited Ayuka, I think, a couple of times. He was one of the most uh, important astrophotography person. And he did a lot of research in developing these techniques to, to the latest technology. So digital images, as I said, can be manipulated on the computer, which means you can do many things. You can enhance the image, do image processing, and so on. And uh, in a in a situation where a comet is being taken, so comet is moving in the night much faster, or rather 
almost much, much faster than a stellar field. So it will show a trail. So which means either you have to take many, many frames or you have to move the telescope along the comet, which is not a sidereal motion, not how the stars move. And people have done it and taken the images of comets. So these kind of things, processing is much easier <coughs> with a digital image or the CCD image. So I will just skip. This is only some introduction. So let's see. Yes. So this is the first uh, sketch of a photometer. Here, what happens? The light comes from the telescope here. So this part enters the Cassegrain hole, which I explained yesterday. And the light really gets uh, first gets focused at a diaphragm, which limits the star. So suppose uh, you're seeing the side view, the star is sitting here. You allow a little bit of sky on the sides. And then, of course, there is something called a Fabry lens, which stabilizes this image finally on the detector. And of course, you have a filter here, and there is a flip mirror, which you, when you flip in this angle, the way it is shown, the light will go on this side and you can see it through the eyepiece. And when you see in the eyepiece, you make sure that this distance and the distance beyond is same so that you get a focused image. And then you just flip it and it will go to the detector. This is one of the latest photometers uh, which we have been using in IUCA for almost 25, 30 years now. It's made by this US company, Optic. Unfortunately, this company is still supplying this, but their production is almost closed now. So we get, get into a lot of difficulty in getting it, but it's a very simple instrument. And you can see, this is that eyepiece I was mentioning. And this little behind is the flip mirror knob. And you can read here B and B. We will define B and B again today. So this slider goes in and out, and there is a small click uh, spring-loaded point. So whether you take observation in B and B, and similarly R and I. Okay. And this is where it enters the telescope. There is a cap here. These are the counts. So I mentioned some counts. So the counts would come here. And by allowing these uh, options, you can set it at say per second count or per, te per 10 seconds. Usually 10 seconds is better because then I average out all the uh, seeing noise or the atmospheric aberrations and so on. And of course, there is an on-off switch. And the, on this side, on this uh, side, you have the power. And inside, there is a battery. But usually, one runs with a, uh, with a external power supply. But this is one type of photometer which is commercially available. This costs, let's say, about, uh, I think it's almost about $2,000 now. Uh, People have made their own photometers. In fact, in Ayuka, we made two types of photometers almost 25 years back. One was a similar to this, not so sophisticated. For, for people who would like to do this on their own, we could train them. But more recently, or rather in the last 20 years, we have made much simpler photometer just to measure the sky batteries. And we do hold such workshops. And through this talk, I can invite you to apply to this now it will be considered as an outreach activity, part of the TLC program of Ayuka. We did one workshop last year around this time. Uh, and we might do it uh, another one once the things get better, where you actually, we select about six or seven participants. It could be teachers. It could be a few quota for amateurs. But essentially, uh, you come here and you learn how to do build the photometer. And then we take one outing and test it. So that is quite exciting. It's about a one week thing. A similar thing is done for radio astronomy also. Okay, so this is what a picture, and you have all heard about exoplanets. So now several hundreds have been found. And in fact, most of the funding, international, national, uh, is for such programs where even large telescopes planned or existing ones are used for exoplanet studies. And this is just a very, kind of an early image, 2000, September, September 16, where an exoplanet transit was seen. So you see, this is a calibration data on a star, which is not uh, varying its intensity, but this one is varying. You see, there is a tip and it comes out. And these data points are taken, but if you can take them out in a shorter time scales, then you can actually see how the planet was obstructing the starlight and again went out. And lots and lots of research can be done on these parts and things like that. This is occultation, eclipse. They're all in the same category of observations. And this can be very effectively done 
uh, with photometers, but of course also done with, uh, with CCD detectors. So this is just showing you uh, how the data would look and there are of course noise and how to handle this. Okay, so when you do a photometry with CCD, you have to make sure that the sky is subtracted. So, so for example, as I will show an image of a CCD. No. You can assume this itself is the image of the CCD, let's say. So suppose this is, this is a star, this is of course a galaxy. And if you want to take the measurement of this star's intensity, you have to subtract, you have to take a little bigger pixel box and subtract the average sky from there. So there are procedures, there are softwares developed which do this. And, and it's a very routine process where actually fairly automated, like you can mask this galaxy and it will pick up only the stars uh, and do the photometry and bring out a list of say 100 stars here. So things have made it very, very automated now. But yes, I mean, uh, initially there were a lot of uh, struggle in developing these tools. So, <clears throat> so CCD camera uh, essentially uh, uh, is the same extension except that now you're doing in two dimension. Okay, and then uh, there are things like uh, atmospheric effects, which really fuzz the star image. So there is something called PSF. Again, I'm not going into details. Is the point spread uh, function. So ideally a star is a point source, right? Now star, as you see from earth, is coming through the atmospheric sky. And the atmospheric absorption makes the star uh, as a hazy, as a, almost a one to two arc second uh, hazy patch. So that, if you actually see it on the CCD, each star is not as sharp as, a, as an ideal single pixel. It's spread over several pixels and you measure it and call it as a PSF, point spread function. So these things are technical things. When you analyze CCD data, you have to take care of these things. So now uh, let's, uh, before going to spectroscopy, I will go back to photometry. And this picture I showed yesterday, these are the U, B, V, and R bands and this is actually showing a star we will see more stellar specter later on in this talk a typical b type star quite hot star and you can see this is the roughly the black body uh, envelope of that star so which means the peak is lying here it's in the blue region right somewhere around 4500 in the b band and then these are the absorption features specific to the atmosphere of that star so what happens in a star can be simulated in the lab, which we will see some slides uh, with, a, with a simple bulb and, uh, and a gas cell, how these absorptions can be simulated in the lab. And that helps to understand how the stellar spectra really comes out. So, the, so on this axis are wavelength. And uh, as I mentioned, most of the people in early years when the other bands detectors were still coming up ultraviolet and infrared and other side, people mostly were concentrating on B, V and R, blue, visible and red. So most of all these hundred years of observations were done with B, V and R. In fact, the photographic films were also having filters and there is a lot of uh, nice data of all over the sky, which have been uh, gathered and are archived. So people go back to those images. They were very good images taking with uh, good telescopes and try to reconfirm what you're observing, whether it is correct. This is just, just to reconfirm, but of course with CCDs, you can go much deeper as I mentioned yesterday. So this one is a slide which I really, you saw it yesterday, but I have added certain things on this. Uh, so I'll spend some time on this. So this axis is again wavelength. And what this shows is, this is a 3000 degree peak of this particular black body radiation. Now, as you saw in the previous image, uh, the spectra will come later, but at least right now, let us discuss simple, pure black body like we talked yesterday. So what are these bands? This is the visible part, ultraviolet and infrared. What I have done today is just added some things on this plot. So this is the wavelength axis and this line here, you can later when you get these slides uh, from a scene, you can expand it and see. This is the blue peak, 450 nanometer, right? 4500. Then this is the visible V550, which is 5500, and R is 6500, okay? And on this side, I have put these bands. These are those color classes. So this shading, which I have done, 
just to distinguish it with this and this and this I have done slightly different shading for the V band, blue, V and R. I'll come to these error bars at the end. So these are the filters. These are broad band. In fact, their filter is more sophisticated. We will see later. But these are basically uh, color glasses. You know? So they have a bandwidth of about 1000 angstroms. And the peak for blue is 4500, I just mentioned. Uh, visible is 55. And red is 6500 angstroms. And what you are doing is you are taking observations. So as I said, we mentioned volumetry yesterday. Volumetry would assume that observation from all the from here to here, minus infinity to infinity, which is impossible, right? So you are limited by doing the sky, the telescope, and finally the filter which you are using, and then the detector. The detector can be CCD or or a photometer, doesn't matter. So these are three BVR. Each one is sitting adjacent to each other. This is crudely divided into thousand thousand angstroms, and so if I let's take the the hotter star here, six thousand degree Kelvin, which is similar to sun, and its peak will be in the yellow green. Yeah, that's why the sun looks yellow green color in daylight. Now, when you are doing photometry, that means you have just three colors, right? B, V, sorry, B, V, and R which means you will measure the black body of that star or the radiation or the spectra of that star at these three positions, B, V, and R. And obviously V measurement will be ideal because it is just matching its peak intensity. But it doesn't matter even for a cooler star, you will still measure B, V, and R. And because of this B minus V concept, which I mentioned, you can work out and get the temperature of the star. So whole idea of this game is, to get the temperature as accurately as possible. Now you will notice that by simple B and V and R, I will be able to measure the temperature to some accuracy. And what is this accuracy? These are the error bars. I have just shown them casually. Now, what is the x-axis error bar? It is the, obviously I'm averaging out this, thousand angstroms. So I'm not really measuring exactly at each and every wavelength. I'm just averaging out within that thousand angstroms. So I put the center point here, and this is the averaging error, right? And what is the y-axis error? I didn't mention it yesterday, but that is basically the counts. So in this case, it is shown as arbitrary units or intensity or counts. It doesn't matter. So it's ultimately the intensity of the measurement. And some of you might have heard, but I should tell you that photons, when they come, they follow what is called as photon statistics, which is Poisonian. So I don't have really a slide on that to explain, but you can go back and check that, which means if I, let's say every second, I am getting 100 photons, correct? Now, what is the error on that? In the next second on your watch or clock, you may not get 100, you will get 99. The next one will be 101. If you keep doing this for many, many, I mean, long time, and really uh, tabulate that, that, that list of these counts. Let's say you start now and do it for an hour. So hour means how many seconds, whatever, thousands of seconds. So you will get a whole lot table of these numbers, 9,900, sometimes 130. And then you do an histogram. And a simple histogram for students, I should say, is always on the x-axis you have bins. In this case, it could be one count bin or two count bin. And y-axis is number of times that has happened. So which means uh, now if you plot a histogram, of course, for doing histogram, you need many, many measurements. That's why you have to wait for an hour to have a uh, sufficiently good table. And you do that, you will get a nice histogram and the envelope of the histogram, when I say envelope, it will look almost like this, it will be like a Poisonian function. And what the statistics tell, that what you have done in one hour means that 100 counts, statistically, you will say that you can predict that the error in that will be plus minus square root of 100. So this is a very interesting uh, statistics, which means Poisson statistics tells you that any moment I can predict within plus minus square root of that base, base count, what is the expected count. So this is an important property, but if you actually add signal and noise in that, again, that requires a couple of slides of uh, discussion I will not cover. Uh, another very good advantage of statistics is 
If I wait for one second, I get an error of say plus minus three counts. Now, if I wait for 10 seconds, interestingly, after 10 seconds, my signal to noise improves by square root of time. So S to N is proportional to square root of time. And this very fact is used by astronomers when they observe very faint objects or arms of galaxies and so on. So the whole night they will observe, collect the photons. Of course, they have to take many frames, otherwise the frames will get saturated by what you call cosmic rays. So this is a standard tool and by taking the advantage of square root of time, you gain in signal to noise. Okay. Now, so I have explained what is photometry and then you have these measurements possible. But now as we go along in spectroscopy, you will notice that by all this method, you can actually tell what is the error in this temperature. So in fact, I give a very standard, uh, this is actually a practical which the students do in MSc astronomy here. They use the same photometer which I showed on an optical bench and later they use the real stars. What they do is these errors by this photon statistics. So suppose they get 122 counts. So square root of 122 will be uh, the error bar on y axis. This axis error bar of course is known that you are doing photometry. So now 122 plus or minus square root of 20. So I tell them take the plus and the minus and similarly for v plus and minus so take plus plus and minus minus and the mean mean, then you will get three different values of temperature. So that is one way of getting the temperature. Error. There are, could be other ways also. So I ask them to not only get the temperature of the artificial source or the real star and also get the errors. So this is a good experiment that they learn a lot in the lab using a simple tungsten bulb. But when they do in the clear sky, they actually use the telescope and some of the standard stars and their temperatures. So this is the thing. Uh, the other thing here is, now you notice that I'm getting an error on this temperature. And it will come basically just to give you uh, a typical number when they do this experiment in the night with the real telescopes or even with the, with the bulbs. Bulbs can't go this high temperature, you know. So they are typically 3000 or lower. So they still get an error of about few hundreds of Kelvin. Right? More the temperature, more the error, of course. So... <clears throat> Why this is happening? Because you are doing photometry. Now, imagine if I could take many, many data points here, right? Uh, so my error bar on Y axis is still there because that is related to the size of the telescope, how many photons you are. If you are collecting more photons, this error bar will obviously come down. But the X axis error bar is reducing. So the overall effect is that you can observe many, many points of observation on this uh, stellar spectra and get a much better accuracy. There are other advantages of doing spectroscopy, which we will see later. For example, from the absorption bands, you can get the surface gravity of the star and so on. One last point here before we move on, uh, I give a very common question to students, which is interesting. Suppose I want to measure the temperature of any of this object, take any of them. And what happens if I just give one filter? I, these two filters are broken. So it is not given to the students. Can you still measure the temperature of that? So obvious answer, of course, people, the smart students can answer easily, but uh, typically it's a clear cut uh, answer is that with one particular observation you, that it could be any of these, right? So you need at least two BR, VR, or at least BV to fix that particular uh, temperature black body curve. Otherwise, you are nowhere, you know, it could pass through any of them. So by doing that, what happens is, then you lock the particular temperature, of course, within the error bars. Okay. Now, we are slowly moving into spectroscopy. So what is continuous spectra? Uh, very soon, these things are changing so fast that maybe 20 years back when I could give this lecture, I could give them a real example. But today is becoming defi uh, definitely not so easy because the tungsten bulbs are slowly going out of fashion. The only place where you see them, even that is changing, is people are using LEDs in automobile lights. But usually in a two-wheeler or a car, you have a, a halogen-filled tungsten bulb. So what is the tungsten bulb? It's giving a continuous spectra. Right? We will go a little more details on that. But essentially, these are the colors which you see, uh, which is called the continuous spectra. And by name, the spectra is continuous. There is no break. Right? Now, uh, suppose 
I so this is a image of the same thing but with an emission spectrum, which means uh, mostly it is dark, but these are the emission lines. So this is actually a mercury lamp. So all your tube lights or even if your CFL bulbs, LED bulbs are different, but CFL and tube lights are mercury. So this is the mercury line, which is 5461, a very common line. Mercury has some doublets. This is some red line here. But uh, yes, this is the most common line. And most of it is dark. Although this is dark here, but actually mercury, uh, what it does is, it's a bad thing about mercury is these lines are sitting on this continuous spectrum. Which means if for astronomy it is bad because all the street lights, now slowly they are going to sodium. But otherwise, if you use uh, mercury, the advantage is it is much brighter, but the disadvantage is all this continuum light is like a, like a tungsten bulb light which you are throwing into the sky. So if you are an astronomer, you don't want the sky to be glowing bright. It's okay if it's a sodium because sodium has only two lines, 5890, And unless you are actually working on the sodium line, most of it is very dark. Uh, I mean, it looks like this. So you are not throwing too much of scattered light into the sky. So for astronomy, it is good. In fact, that's why most of the cities, which are ideally no cities should be there. But if they are close to observatories where good telescopes and observations, the civil, uh, the municipality, tries to educate people to use sodium lights or even reduce the intensity and particularly having covered light so that light is only for the floor or the street, not for the sky. So this is emission spectrum. Very next one is an absorption. So exactly the same places you have absorption and emission. Now the difference here is just like star. So I think if I show this picture, this is what will make the things much clearer. This is my incandescent bulb or the the kind of uh, tungsten bulb I mentioned. And if I don't do anything, forget on the right side, then you get this continuous spectrum. But now in between there is a gas. Then the light is absorbed through that. And you have these absorption lines, which are dark lines, right? Which are dips in this black body spectrum. So this is actually black body spectrum. And if the gas, surrounding gas, or this in between gas has something which is emitting because of exciting, excitement because of uh, UV photons or whatever, then you will have corresponding emission lines. In fact, both combinations are possible in some astronomy cases, but mostly they are this. Now, this is what is a basic spectrometer. So till now we talked about only BVR. Now I will go into finer uh, bins. I call it bins because those are spectral bins. So whatever was 1000 angstrom will become now smaller and smaller. As we go along, these uh, definitions will become more clear. What I'm showing here is just as a lens, but actually it is the telescope, right? Which is the collecting area of the telescope. So ideally, what you do is you allow it to be focused here and you put a slit. Why slit? Because then you will image and you move the telescope in such a way that you point it to a galaxy, the whole galaxy is light or a particular star or whatever. That slit is selecting that. Now, before doing spectroscopy, you need what is called as a disperser. We will define this, which will disperse this light into different colors, right? So the disperser is always traditionally put in a parallel section. So I have what is called collimator because it collimates this diverging light into collimation means it makes it parallel. And then you have a camera lens, which will take this parallel light as if it was from the telescope and then focus it into this uh, spectrum. Originally, the older times, people could have photographic film here. Now, CCDs are. Or you could even actually just forget 2D. You can just put a photometer and tilt this. As we'll see, one by one, these wavelengths will come on this small aperture here, and you can generate a spectrum. So the spectrum can be generated as a function of this moment. But again, you can already see the advantage. You don't have any moving part. You just directly get the image, which is the spectrum in case of CCD. And all these advantages are there, some of it we will see. So this is the basic sketch of a uh, spectrometer and you can have here a grating prism and other dispersers. So this is what is actually happening in the night. I told you, so this picture now it has come, I, I could have shown this yesterday. This is how a starlight is seen actually. And what is this? The edge to edge is about that, you remember that four, 
uh, inch, 100 millimeter uh, effect of atmosphere. So even if you go to a very good site, <coughs> you will improve this. So edge to edge is about one arc second. On a city where we are sitting right now, I am in Pune, in the night, the skies are deteriorating. But typically, it will be only two arcs. But if you go to a high mountain in Monarchia or in dark places, you will find this about an arc second, or sometimes even better than one arc second. So this is, the light is all distributed. So if you take a total of this, you will find it as some count. But this is continuously changing because this, every 10 milliseconds, the starlight is dancing within this random thing. And obviously, if I put a slit, I am not collecting whole of it. I am collecting only a part in this slit's rectangle. And that's why when you do all this dispersion business, this is how the picture looks. And here, as I said, in a spectrograph, you can put different slits, or you can have these, this whole thing can be a CCD, and you can run these. So one pixel. So this axis will be your wavelength axis, and this axis will take care of the neighboring sky. And you can actually uh, get the spectrum point by point on the sky. So let's now talk of some basic definitions. Spectral resolution, it's much simpler to understand, lambda by delta lambda, which means suppose I am only in the V band, then this numerator is 5500 angstroms. We discussed a little while ago. And delta lambda is the resolution. So in case of photometry, it was 1000 angstroms, right? So now R, this capital R is less than 10, right? This is a number. Uh, then comes the next category, which is called the low resolution spectroscopy. <coughs> you can, people doing photometry may not be happy to use the word. They may say, okay, let us call it narrow band photometry. Now I've slightly improved it. Now these have become about 100 angstrom filters. So now R is within 100, okay? Then, so we are still using uh, filters or narrowband filter. Sometimes you can say you can still use probably prisms. So we are getting into the era of real spectroscopy. This is where really spectroscopy has started. <coughs> this is medium resolution spectroscopy. What you see here is R is now 100 to 10,000. In this category, on the lower edge, you will have prisms, but on this side, you will have gratings or combination of prism and gratings. We will see that. And this is really on the high side where R is 10,000. So now I'm only given definitions, but interestingly what will happen all this when you combine with the light, which is so little, you remember Vega, 1000 photons, what you get at on earth with telescope and all that, you will be only a few photons, but remember Vega is only zero magnitude. And people have been taking observations of spectra of very faint objects up to 20, 25th magnitude. So imagine you need, very big telescope to collect on that light. You need all this efficiency, which we will come very soon. So this is where the first confusion comes. This word has again come. I, I had cautioned you yesterday. Now this has a totally different meaning. And interestingly, the, this was done by a French uh, optician and an astronomer called Jacquino. And there is a book reference at the end, last slide. He used the word etinidu, which is basically throughput. So, but when the English language translation was done, it turns out it became luminosity and a lot of confusion happened. This is not the L luminosity of the total star. Okay, this has to be, there will be one more place this luminosity will come. And this is uh, the solid angle and this is the area. So L, so this is what uh, this person, Jacquino, almost, I would say almost 60, 70 years back, found, that's why I put it in bold, L into R is a constant. And this concept is exactly like, I'll just slightly remind you when you did your, I'm sure all of you have done the sodium D1, D2 in your BSC lab, where you had a, a spectrometer and you had a slit. And if you narrow down the slit, you will start seeing both the lines separately. But if you widen the slit, the line starts merging, although the difference between the two D1, D2 is six angstrom, but unless you have a good uh, grating or something, you can't really resolve them very well. So this is something like that. If you narrow the slit, you're able to resolve it better. So the R is improving, but the light coming out net to your human eye, at least in your uh, lab case, you are using your eye, it becomes fainter. And the reverse, when you 
increase the slit width, you're allowing more light, but your resolution goes down. So the constant means the combination is a constant. This is almost like your, I mean, just mathematically, it's like uncertainty principle, right? So this is always a constant. So this constant, we have removed that A, suppose that is common. And for three different instruments, grating, Fabry Perot, and I'm comparing them. So, I, I mean, these things become a little more clearer when we go further. So what happens is, uh, here we see the comparison that a uh, grating and a Fabry Perot, the Fabry Perot is at least 100 times better than grating. Again, this is kind of a misnomer or a illusion because Fabry Perot works on a specific wavelength, whereas grating gives you a whole spectrum. So there is a catch here, but yes, on that specific wavelength, Fabry Perot works 100 times better efficiency. Okay. So this slide essentially talks of the same thing I was telling you increasing slit width, more light accepted but resolution goes down and the reverse uh, also is there. So what happens for some dispersers, when I say dispersers, which is prism grating or higher resolution instruments, for the same value of R, they can accept more light. So this accepting more light is referring to L cross R, which became, so that's why it becomes more luminous, more throughput or more attended you. So this is where the confusion between French and English happened those years. And now, of course, it is understood. And uh, so, so this is very important that L cross R is important here. And uh, for the same resolution in the three categories, you have better and better efficiency, of course, with some criteria. And when you combine an instrument with a telescope, you have to do many things. You have to see that the light which you are collecting from the telescope is fully utilized by the spectrum. Solid angle. Otherwise, you are throwing out light as we saw in, the, in this image. Okay, so now this is just a simple comparison. I did this. I all this was done long back when I was doing my PhD, my PhD or every Perot. So I had to go through all these uh, discussions, and of course, none of this is in, in a book. So if you make area collecting and this collecting, then comparing with a spectrometer, you still get much larger output from the Fabry Perot. Or if you make these two comparable, the area and the throughput then you have much better resolution. And the last one is very important in relation to yesterday's talk. If you make area and throughput common, then you need a very small instrument. So it's nice to have a light instrument at the back, uh, back of the telescope, but of course with the restriction that you are working only on a specific line, like the mercury 5461 uh, five, or sodium or, or orion, things like that. You remember Raleigh was mentioned yesterday. This is again now in this, that was spatial resolution. Now we are talking about two spectra, exactly the same definition. This is 80% of these two peaks. These two spectral lines are same, but the situation can be there when this, this fellow is not same as this. It is just gives him a kink here, which means there is a differential motion happening uh, within the gas. So this is the same concept for Raleigh criterion. Now, I'll just move a bit faster uh, now. Uh, this is again the table, this and this are the two tables which were part of my work that time. So what we are comparing here is, this is the dispersal. Prism, grating, interferon, interference, uh, things like Fabry Perot or Fourier transform. And dispersal, which is dispersing the light, right? Into, so uh, I forgot to mention many of the basic optics book you will see a beautiful picture, most of them, with Newton sitting with a prism in his hand and in a, of course in a, in a dark room where the light, sunlight is coming from a small hole in the window. The light falls on the prism on his hand and on the right side, he projects it like a nice beautiful continuum spectra on the uh, wall. So prism is one of the first uh, dispersers which were used and it is dispersing by uh, process called refraction. This one for the moment uh, you can neglect because it's a little more involved. And it works from almost 2000 angstroms in ultraviolet to near infrared, right? And they fall in, so I told you three categories. So they fall in R less than 500, low category. The next is grating. Refraction principle is used. This is uh, the number of beams. Uh, for the moment you can skip this. And it can work from X-rays to microwaves. And now this is medium, 500 to 
uh, almost 10,000. This side is cut here. And last, the high resolution is these two. And sometimes high resolution can be combination of this. Or for example, here, it can be combination of these. There is something called grism, which is a combination of prism and gray. And here you can go to ultraviolet to sub-millimeter, and now we are talking more than 10,000. But the next slide is even more interesting. So remember, this is the low, medium, and high. Uh, these are the resolution powers. So this is 10 times better. This is 10 times better than this. So 100 times better than this. At NLU, purposely I've written the French word, which is the output of this system is worse in this comparison. But this is better and this is best. Again in that specific wavelength pin. So if I compare this Jacquino principle L cross R, this is about 10 to 50 times what is prism and this is about up to 500 times. Now the last column here is very, very important. First one, Newton example I gave, you guess just a nice spectrum. So there is no ambiguity, there is no confusion. Now when you, and spectrum recovery, you just take the image, Either you scan it, take it on CCD, do digital processing, straightforward, there is no confusion. But in this, you already start getting, because you are asking higher resolution, things start becoming, the spectrum recovery becomes difficult. So now you have several spectrums sitting next to each other and you have to sort them out either with a filter or with a low resolution grating, uh, uh, prism. And that's why the word grism comes, where in prism you have a, you have a prism on which the lines are cut. We'll see how a prism and a prism looks. So to remove those overlapping orders. And finally, this here, you don't even see the spectrum. You have to do deconvolution or inverse transform. And interestingly, these things, they sound okay mathematically, but they were a challenge at least 30, 40 years back when you take a big spectra from required computers, which were essentially slow. But with the new technologies and the new fast Fourier transform developed and the faster computers, these things are no more a limitation. Um, okay, I'll skip this. Skip this. Let's see uh, what uh, I mentioned. Of course, these two things were clear to you. What is absorption? Now what? In the next few slides, I'm going to talk about the spectral line itself. So you remember I gave an example of sodium D1, D2 line or uh, I gave example of mercury 5461 green line. These are all emission lines in case of bulbs. In case of atmosphere of stars, the hydrogen line HLFYZ uh, 6563, it's an absorption one, right? So uh, <clears throat> what is this line? I mean, how, what is the basic, how does the line form? So that is what we are discussing in the next couple of slides. There is something called natural battery. And we will very soon see that this comes from the uncertainty principle, the transition of two levels in an atom. Doppler broadening comes from the uh, temperature of the gas. And this needs two parts, which I will explain. Pressure broadening, and somebody asked yesterday about rotational broadening. So these are the other parts. But these two are the most fundamental things which are always happening. Okay. So firstly, let's skip this. This is how a spectral line is now I've expanded the x-axis, which is wavelength. It could be an emission line like this, or this is of course absorption line. So what is the area under this line in this wavelength x-axis scale? I can just always make it as a rectangle. This shaded part area is exactly equal to this area under this line. And this is called the equivalent width, W lambda. And a lot more physics or astrophysics comes out from this absorption and the equivalent width, which I'm not going into. Uh, but this is a very basic concept in a spectral line. And this picture <clears throat> shows the two things that is happening. So inside curve, so this is a bit confusing. I will just run the cursor so that I understand what is happening. Uh, this is one spectra. This is, you can see this is Gaussian, right? This is Gaussian shape. And this one is, starting like this, going like this, and going like this. So Gaussian falls off very fast, right, at the wings. But this takes, I mean, it will almost go up to infinity. This is Lorentz shape. This corresponds to the natural burden due to the uncertainty principle. And this is the Doppler effect. Now we'll go each and 
each of these one by one. So this is the first thing. The atom excites to this level and comes down and radiates H nu, the photon. And that is what is natural body. And it's a Lorentzian shape. Typically, the, the atom will stay in this for some time unless it is spontaneous uh, emission. And uh, then that time is about in nanoseconds. And that gives rise to this broadening, which is given by this formula. And let's say in red region, it's now, these are the numbers which have to be very careful. This is 002 milli angstrom. So we're talking of very narrow line, right? And this is always there in a natural body, whether it is happening in astronomy or in the lab or wherever. Natural body is always there. It's almost like a delta function. This picture is very nice. And <clears throat> this is taken from the book, which I will refer at the end by, by, by a lady called Thorn, A.P. Thorn, and it's a very good book. So I would insist you to read that book. Basically what it shows is, this is a collection of atoms which are emitted. So let's say you have a tube light in which all these atoms are moving in a random way. And you are looking at the tube light on this direction. Some of these atoms are coming towards you, some are going away. So of course, this is your school level thing. Going away will give red shift and coming towards you will give blue shift. But some of them are moving laterally. They will not give any shift. So essentially, this is the central line where they are moving laterally and the red shift on this side and blue shift. So this is generating the net effect of all these atoms is you are seeing this. And this is a Gaussian curve and any random process in physics is always a Gaussian. So this is what is happening and you can measure this. And this next slide talks about that. This can be derived very easily by Boltzmann statistics. I will not go into this. In that book, very nicely in two pages that has been derived. So these are some constants here. The width of that line is equal to this formula with T is the temperature of that gas and M is the mass number. So in this case, now remember that was 002, this is 03. So 10 times more broader than the natural. So if that is delta function, this is really a broader line. For sun, uh, this will be about 0, 03 and so on, right? And this is Gaussian shape. Then one effect which is there called Zeeman effect, you have heard this in physics. In laboratory, you can actually generate this. You have a hydrogen line tube and you put a magnet, a strong magnet and the line will split into two. And from this gap, you can measure the magnetic field. There's a basic Zeeman effect. In this case, I'm showing a blue line here. And the formula for that is given here. So let's not go details. But what is interesting in astronomy, what happens is stars can have very high magnetic field. In fact, some stars can have 1,000 to even 30, the highest known having 30,000 kilowatts. Just as a quick question to you, but unfortunately, I will have to answer the question myself. Uh, the gravity, uh, the magnetic field on surface of Earth is only half a Gauss, right? What is on Sun is also about a Gauss, but definitely not on the black spots where the magnetic field is much, much higher. And Sun is like a star. So some of the stars actually have these spots, which the magnetic field can be very high. I think this particular star is called Barnard star, which has almost 30,000 uh, kilo Gauss, uh, 30,000 uh, Gauss. So, from that, you can see very nicely the split will be very easy to measure, uh, running into almost uh, 0.6 angstroms. The last is the rotational broadening. Uh, here, it's like uh, if the star is not rotating and you see the spectra like this, so this is, for example, H alpha, let's say whatever H alpha, beta, and other lines. Sorry, H alpha will be on this side. And if the star is rotating, right? Then what will happen, these lines will uh, keep shifting. And this shift will introduce the broadening. So you can actually measure these broadenings and get the rotational broadening and the rotational velocity. So somebody had asked this question yesterday. This is one technique. Of course, there is a bit of confusion here. You can have two stars which are moving around each other. Then also you can have but then the, the good thing about it is that both the stars, unless very rare, one will be a cool star, one will be a hot star. So they will have different spectrum. So you can split them out and see which one is moving. And you can monitor the monitoring of this 
wavelengths on the x-axis with the standard lab source and tell which one is moving at what speeds. Okay, now we just uh, quickly go to the basic things about uh, grating spectrometer. This is just a source, this is just a schematic. The grating moves and the spectrum moves here. So either you move the grating and fix a detector here or let it be fixed here. You take a full image of CCD and then analyze that digital image. So again, definitions now in more mathematical way, disperser already told you separates wavelengths by spatially spreading them out. Dispersion is measure of the spreading, angular dispersion d theta by d lambda, and the linear dispersion, the, there will be, I mentioned camera lens, so this focal length will come. Now actually you will have each, uh, each point here in this will, this is, so this is DL, right? Small, small bins in length will correspond to corresponding uh, wavelength, uh, d lambda. So this is how you do it. And in fact, this is more important nanometer by millimeter. So, which means on this, each millimeter corresponds to what delta lambda bin in, in this case, I have put nanometer or angstroms. Uh, this is how the grating grooves are done. Grating is a very old technology, almost 100 years old. Earlier people used to use, uh, I mean, stable glass like borosilicate and actually had diamond uh, on a machine which was cutting these grooves. But it was difficult to keep this in storage. There are still original gratings available because dust will collect and that will deteriorate the light uh, diffraction process. They will introduce scattering. Rather, people make replicas using uh, various techniques, synthetic gratings, and they are more easy to clean and so on. So more or less now, they are actually uh, replicas, uh, uh, synthetic gratings and so on. This is the basic grating. Again, I am not going too much details into this because time is short. This is the incoming light. And this is, assume this as a simple mirror with some grooves here, right? So if it's a simple mirror, it would come out here, right? Same angle. If this is the normal, this is the grating normal. If it is a mirror, it will come out at the same angle. But since these grooves are there, you, and there is something called blazing, which allows the efficiency of the light to come out in this particular direction, all these angles come in the picture. This is the groove spacing, which is D. So if you do this, uh, so I'm not going, except that this picture talks about the overlapping I was mentioning, right? So this white line is zeroth order. On left and right, you will have different orders. Again, not too much of detail in this lecture, but these, suppose you are blazing, means if you want to improve it at a particular efficiency angle, then all others, all others have to be masked. Otherwise, you will get a total mess. This spectrum will merge with this and so on, side by side. So you actually use filters, filters, and only use this one which you want. Uh, skip this, skip this. So this is actually a very high resolution spectra of sun. I mentioned sun, Newton, holding prism. Now you can see actually sun has just a G-type stars. All these spectral lines are seen here. And I can't take from this end to this end, it will go outside the wall of my room. So people take parts and you stitch them. This point will come here and you keep stitching them, then you get a long spectrum. So everything has come on the CCD. And of course, there is Escher is a special technique where you can split the spectrum into all these parts. So this is very common here. And this is a very high resolution spectrum of sun. Uh, I will leave this on the slide because you will all get access to this PDF. This is only a Simple design, uh, not a formal thing. Suppose you are asked to develop a spectrometer and you are given a 50 mm wide grating and it's, this is the focal length of the, of the camera lens and the grating has these many grooves and so on. And this is the diffraction angle and the wavelength blazing. What you are supposed to calculate is the reciprocal linear resolution, the DL by D theta, theoretical resolution and actual resolution. So this is important, the two and three, you can calculate theoretically something, but what you will get because of scattering or other effects will be much less. So just skip this, but this is how, uh, this is the actual, uh, that 3.2, so 32 angstroms per millimeter on the CCD. And this is the theoretical resolution 60,000. You can already see it is in the medium resolution category. And what you actually do by building this instrument and measuring it in the lab, 
So you need a very narrow line to check. So you can use laser or a very narrow sort of line and take a scan and you will see that what you actually achieve is our own factor of 10 lower. So instead of 60,000, it has become 6,200. And this can be actually measured and you can prove it that you got 0, 0,9 nanometer, which is about one angst. So that is the resolution of this instrument. Uh, again, I have to skip all this, there are too much of details. This is just a nice picture of an instrument, which is any formal astronomer who has done spectroscopy in the last 30, 40, 50 years would have experience with this telescope. This is called Kude Feet 0.9 meter telescope in Arizona uh, in, uh, on a mountain there. It's about 2,500 meters south of US. Me and my colleague from Delhi University, we developed a very large spectral library. We observed hundreds of spectra of different stars. So what is this doing? This is on the terrace. And of course, US being very strict, you can't really walk there unless you are a technician. And uh, this is a, so this 0.9 meter is the mirror of the telescope. The light comes from the sky. This is of course cloudy picture. Light comes here and comes there, it reflects and then enters here. From the terrace, it goes to one floor down. And I told you the large spectrographs can be really as big as huge rooms. So this is the one floor below where the light has come down from terrace. And you have putting all the instruments here, the calibration lamps and things like that. Right. Then one more floor down is where the grating is. And this is a huge grating, you see. And back of this, there is the detector. So I have a better picture of that. This is the detector. And, uh, and barely see there is some steam coming out. This is the cooling of the detector. This is the electro electronics. And this is a, almost a huge hall there on the two floors down underground. And this detector is very stable because it's a liquid nitrogen to cool the detector. And only once in the evening and in the morning, the technician would come and fill it. It's a very stable instrument. And we observed uh, almost 1200 spectra. So this is an example of one such yellow star. It's a K-type star. And you can see this is looks. So this is a K-type star. The peak is somewhere in, in the yellow region. Now, this looks like a noise, you see. But no, if you see the envelope, this is the black body of that star. And these are the absorption features, which look almost like noise. But if you expand this part, they are real absorption features. So we built this almost 1,200 such uh, spectra of cooler O to B to A to F type stars. And that is called Indo US Spectral Library, which has almost more than 500 citations now, maybe 600. And this was developed about 10 years back. And a lot of people have started using this to do various, so quickly I will tell you two places this is useful. One is you have a total light from a galaxy, which has a combination of all types of stars, hot and cool. So how do you disentangle that if you have a total light? So you will use such libraries and try different mixtures and see whether there is 70% hot stars, 10% cool, 10% even cooler. So this is a very uh, non-unique solution. So people use these libraries. And also they are used for many other stellar regulation studies. I will not go into detail. Um, given the time, I, I was to cover this Febripar of the high resolution. I think the time is not enough because we have to answer questions. Uh, this is just a picture of Febripar images. They look like neutron rings. This is on the high resolution category. And this has very interesting uh, uh, techniques which we use. So you, I leave the slides with you so you can probably uh, but in the references, you will see the books there, which dedicated books on, on Febri Perot. This was almost a uh, hundred year old technology, more than hundred. Perot was French uh, and uh, Febri was uh, Britisher, but actually in France, that's why they call Perot Febri. Okay, so I will just skip all this and let's just simply come to, this is how the Febri Perot, which around looks actually, we have such uh, Febri Perot in Ayuka. Uh, I am bound to now skip these things also. How you do an observation of spectrum, you have to calibrate. So before going, you should be ready which star you will observe, the data reduction process, and whether the, that particular star is available at your observatory in the night in that month. This is actually a spectra taken from the lamp, helium neon. And this is the continuous uh, spectra taken from a white uh, halogen bulb. And this is the lamp spectra. You see this faint dips here. This is the stars, standard star spectra. 
And this is the supernova which was observed. And this is the calibration spectra. This is all the software is giving this. And I told you about the blue sensitivity of CCD detector. So these are all CCD spectra. Red, because silicon, it has a better sensitivity. Blue is less. So you invert this curve. And then finally, this is for the standard star. You can already see this is a hot star with absorption features. If I have observed from my observatory this, 100 observatories across the world would have also observed the same. So you standardize your observations just like the Vega example. And this is the actual spectra of the reduced spectra of the uh, supernova. So this is the last slide where I have given all this uh, list, basic book on spectroscopy, little more advanced. This is the book I was mentioning, uh, which is a very nice book. I mean, during my PhD days 30 years back, I think I just read it overnight, like a novel, very little mathematics, but explains many things very well. This is the one on February Perot. This is a very important book. There are, I think, later versions of this are also there. The name is very uh, misleading, electronic imaging astronomy, but most of whatever I talk is really covered here, detectors, instrumentation, all these atmospheric things, spectral classification. This is the book I mentioned yesterday, where two chapters me and my colleague have written. This is an IGNU publication. So you can actually download this now, although the hard copy is available for, I think, couple of hundreds from me. So I will stop here and I will take the questions first, Asim. Uh, so. Uh, yes, Anjan, you can go ahead and take questions. Yeah, so I think I'll do that. I'll just yeah. move this fellow here. So you can see the, these questions. Just, just give me a second because this window I need to, Oh, should I? Uh, I just need this window to go there. Yeah. So, okay, let's see what we have on the, what exactly CCD somebody has asked. So it requires a full, uh, so the Maclean's book gives you all detail. It's basically an imaging detector. Gra Arjun has asked graph that you have showed in the transit of a planet. Can bending light due to gravity be measured from that graph? Uh, not really. You need much more sophisticated observations for bending of light. Uh, this that that graph which I showed was primarily for uh, exoplanet observations. BVR are not symmetric in wavelength. Okay, uh, Shatanik has asked Shatanik Bhattacharya, uh, why BVR are not symmetric? So this is again conventional. Uh, when this BVR photometry was done several decades back, these were called Johnson UBVI. The Johnson was the observer who defined these bands. So today people do even uh, different kind of narrow bands and all, but again, as being an old subject, people stick to that. So you have to normalize to standard thousand angstrom bands. So there is a procedure in reduction of data where this uh, asymmetry in the bands is taken care of. Uh, uh, error bar taken data referred to standard deviation of photon count. Yeah, essentially standard deviation is that. So you see the every pixel may not be uh, equally effective or, yes. So that's a good question which Arjun has asked. Each CCD is not identical. So there is something called cosmetic defect. So people allow the CCD to see a white light, which is a white uh, screen or on an instrument. And you have to normalize all the sensitivities of each pixel, which becomes a tough thing, but there is some procedure called flat fielding, which is used for this. Uh, okay, what is the shape of natural bordering? What, why is the natural bordering shape? So the natural bordering is a Lorentzian shape and it can be derived, I didn't derive it, but uh, you can derive that function. It's a mathematical function. This is derives from the uncertainty principle. Level. So just like you can derive the Boltzmann function to get a Gaussian. Is there a collisional broadening in stellar line which we should find in laboratory to get a spectral line? Uh, spectral line in laboratory. I gave the example of uh, mercury. So I didn't have time. Uh, imagine the tube light atoms in that picture with human eye. All the gases are randomly moving inside that volume. So you get a Doppler broadening, right? But if you move the telescope at a high speed from you, which is what is happening in astronomy, you have an overall shift in the line. 
So Doppler effect has two parts. One is Doppler shift and one is Doppler broadening. Both were kind of discussed in my talk, but in astronomy, both are happening. For example, Orion Nebula, the 5007 green line, which you see the nice picture of Orion, is coming from the green line of oxygen, uh, the third ionization. So the atoms of oxygen emitting that line give rise to that broadening, and you can actually calculate the temperature from that. But also the Orion is a nebula. So if you can have a telescope which can see some parts of that nebula, you will see different motions, differential motions. And people have done it. They have actually made a mapping by using Febripero instrument and found these uh, differential velocities of the motion within the nebula. So that is where an ideal example where Doppler shift and Doppler broadening both are happening together. So the only uh, quick, uh, Example for that is if I ask somebody to move with the tube light at very high speed, so the whole Doppler broadening of the 5461 line, as you observe, will not be at a laboratory refer, uh, reference of 5461. It will be shifted depending on your redshift or blue shift. Okay, then is there a jet stream coming out? Can we rule out the competition of velocity of light with spectroscopy? Now, this is little involved question jet coming out of the star. I can only say that uh, uh, some stars with their envelopes have or they have shelves that's why over and above the continuous spectrum they show uh, emission spectrum they are called b stars so that's why both uh, are playing in such stars atmosphere b stars where you have absorption as well as some emission levels lastly what material is used to construct filters uh, that's a technical question usually uh, very flat glasses are used in case of BVR, the Johnson filters, there are standard uh, glasses made by Short and other companies. In fact, in Ayuka, we have ourselves made these uh, filters some time back, BVR, uh, and we still have a stock of them. And in principle, under the TLC program of outreach, we may build, rebuild that lab to make more of these filters. So I think that takes care of these uh, questions from Zoom, but I can have this, uh, other questions from before I go to the YouTube questions, uh, see if there are any hands, uh, then audio questions can be answered. Asim? Yeah, Ranjan. Is there any hand uh, asking verbal question on Zoom? Then I can answer. No, I don't see any hands raised. Okay, fine. Ah, wait, there is one. There is one hand okay. raised, Shatanik Bhattacharya. Yeah. Can you handle unmuting? Can you see? So what is the question? Uh, okay, one minute, I will just unmute. And where is this? Yeah, go ahead. Hello, good afternoon, sir. Yes. Sir, do the photons incident on the pixels heat the CCDs up? If they do, does the surface area of the pixels increase, thus affecting the flux count as they heat up with time? Okay, again, a technical question. Firstly, I should tell you, uh, basically the, the light, unless you are actually shining a laser on the CCD, you know, a bright laser, it may burn the pixel. But what we are talking here in astronomy, the, the things are so faint, that effect cannot be there about heating. But interesting counterpart of that is that, uh, yes, in some uh, laboratory uh, setup, this can be an issue. I mean, not in astronomy, of course, because we are talking about so faint photons. But yes, in uh, in laboratory, this can happen, and people have to take care of these uh, these kind of heating effects. So, so yes, that can happen. That can damage the CCD. So, but typically, CCDs are quite rugged. They are silicon devices. They have protection film on that, and so on. You can read more about the CCDs in that Maclean's book. Any other question? If not, uh, Ranjan, I don't see anything else. Okay, now I see the YouTube questions. I don't see them. Is there anything there? <coughs> ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So there are some. Uh, only three are there. Kripa Ram, how exoplanets are observed, sir? Uh, so that was in that picture where you have to. Uh, so essentially, uh, you don't know a particular star has a variable light, it could be due to two stars or it could be a small dip 
because the planet is usually a very small area obstructing the, the surface of the star. So a small dip means you have to have a very precision photometry in millimagnitudes. You remember magnitude I defined, so it will be 0, 0, 001, 0, 0, 002. So the precision is very important and either photometry, very high precision photometers or CCDs can do this. So there have been found many such exoplanets and of course you need, uh, because the dip is so small, you need, uh, you need uh, better telescopes to collect more light. And these are increasingly becoming uh, available now. There is a huge database of exoplanets. There are space missions which are also observing exoplanets. Uh, Yogesh has asked two questions. What is a DUR? Now, just a quick answer. Everybody has is knowing what is a flask, right? Uh, not in your age group, but earlier times, there were glass flasks made by Eagle Company close to Pune. Uh, this is for cooling your tea and coffee, right? Either cold drink or a coffee. So it's a double walled glass vacuum. And vacuum is a bad insulator. So that is the convention of a flask. When you do for CCD, Remember, if I mentioned yesterday, it is cool to liquid nitrogen, which is almost minus 150 degrees centigrade from atmosphere. So it has to have a flask-like system. What is, so that is technically called a DUR, where you have, instead of glass, it's a steel flask. Now, fortunately, now you have any grocery shop or any utensil shop will sell you small uh, uh, flask made of steel vacuum inside. So they are more rugged because they won't break. So exactly the same thing is there in a DUR. The CCD is sitting inside the vacuum shell. It's a, it's a, it's a DUR which is evacuated with this uh, steel shell. And uh, you have liquid nitrogen inside the shell. The only thing is the liquid nitrogen is boiling off because it is at minus 150 degrees centigrade. So you have to keep filling liquid nitrogen or there is a way to keep it in a closed DUR system. And there is something called a copper braid, just like uh, what the ladies uh, have, a, what is Hindi called choti. It's a braid, braided copper, which connects to that boiling liquid to the CCD back. So it is convey, convection of that cold uh, effect goes to the CCD. So there are various things happening at that temperature. What happens? You will have fogging on the front glass. So there is a heater ring to remove the fogging. So yes, Diwar is the basic thing to enclose the CCD for a cooler temperature. The second question he has asked is about, I think, power law, which will come up in many other, uh, many other uh, contexts in all the lectures. Power law is basically, uh, it's the mathematical expression. So suppose you have, so the variation is to the power of minus three, which means if you plot it, the exponent will be minus three. So that is the power law exponent. So, so many spectra have two, three components of power law. You know, some part in the blue may be straight, then it is going exponentially higher. So that's why the power law comes. I think that's it. There is no more questions. So I guess I will stop here. And uh, I have given the reference to the last uh, slide. You have uh, all the references there. And of course, my email is there on my first slide. So anybody has queries, you can always ask me over email. Thank you, everyone.